Thank you so much for checking out Learn Linux TV, your source for Linux related fun and learning. I just love making this content for you guys, but making such content isn't cheap. If you enjoy my content, please consider supporting me by becoming a patron. As a patron, you'll enjoy ad free versions of every video that I upload, and also, at specific tiers, you'll also enjoy early access to select videos before the rest of the world. But even if you're not able to support me by becoming a patron, no problem, there's other ways to help. You can simply click the like button on the videos that you enjoy that would help out. In addition to that, word of mouth helps as well. So if you're enjoying my content, please help spread the learning by telling your friends and coworkers about the channel. If you're looking for something to read, well, you're in luck, I write books. And you can check out my latest books at learnlinux.tv slash books. Are you looking for help for your Linux server related projects? Or are you a business that has a Linux related project that you're working on and you need another set of hands? Well, you're in luck. Go to learnlinux.tv slash request hyphen assistance. There you can check out my schedule and consider hiring me to help you out. With all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started with today's video. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's episode of Linux Essentials, it's all about OpenSSH. OpenSSH, or more simply SSH, is the standard when it comes to remote administration of your Linux servers. But the thing is, you really shouldn't be using password authentication. But in order to disable password authentication, you first have to set up public key authentication, which is going to be the subject matter of today's video. Now, I already have a video, a guide on OpenSSH that you should definitely check out. And this is one of those things that's included in that video, but I wanted to make this dedicated video because again, you guys really shouldn't be using password authentication anymore. So we're going to take a look at public key authentication in this video. And then if you wanna learn even more about OpenSSH, you can check out the guide that I also have on this channel right now. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, before we continue, we will need to make sure that SSH itself is working, because without that, then obviously public key authentication isn't going to work at all. Here on my laptop, I'm running Ubuntu, but when it comes to Linux, it doesn't really matter what distribution you're running, because every distribution that I've ever used includes the SSH client by default. And we can verify that by running which and then SSH. And here we see that that command did in fact produce output. If it didn't, then that means that the SSH client is not installed. But again, every distribution that I've ever used includes the SSH client, so you shouldn't need to do anything at all when it comes to Linux. On macOS, it's essentially the exact same thing. We could run which SSH, and if that produces output, that means we have the SSH client installed. So here we can see that the SSH client is actually located at slash user slash bin slash SSH. So what we can glean from this is that when it comes to installing the SSH client, there's nothing that we'll have to do on macOS or Linux. It's already installed. So the only thing that leaves then is Windows. That's actually the only operating system nowadays that doesn't have the SSH client installed by default. So here I am on a Windows PC, and on Windows there's actually several methods that we can use to obtain the SSH client. And the most popular method is going to be using PuTTY, which is a free application that you can download that gives you access to an SSH client. And the process of using PuTTY to set up public key authentication is quite a bit different when compared to macOS and Linux, so we're going to cover that at the end of this video. But since I'm here on this Windows PC right now, what I'll do is show you how to install PuTTY, and then we'll come back to Windows later. So what I'm going to do is go to putty.org, and we'll click right here to download PuTTY. We'll just grab the latest installer, and we'll go ahead and save it. And it's a small download. In fact, it's already done. So I'm going to run the installer. And now we're done. So we should have PuTTY installed now. It should be right here in the start menu. So I'll scroll down. 
And sure enough, here it is. Again, we'll come back to PuTTY later in the video, but at least for right now, we have access to an SSH client on every operating system. All right, so let's take a look at the process of generating an SSH key pair for use with OpenSSH. And that process is actually the same on macOS and Linux, so here on my Ubuntu laptop, I'm going to show you the command. And for those of you out there that are using macOS, you'll be able to use the same command. Now first, we need to make sure that we don't already have an SSH key pair on our system. And the reason for that is because the command that I'm about to show you will overwrite any keys that are currently in the default location, so we need to make sure that there's no key already there first. So what I'll do is list the storage of the .ssh directory that's in my home directory. It's currently empty. If you see an error on your end that that directory doesn't already exist, that's okay. The next command that I'm going to show you will create that directory if it doesn't already exist. Now, if you did actually see keys in this directory on your end, you'll definitely want to make sure you back them up before we continue. So let's go ahead and generate the key. And the command that we'll use is ssh-keygen, and we'll use the dash b option. And what the dash b option allows us to do is specify the bit size. And I'll set a bit size of 4096, which is actually a lot stronger than the default. So I'll press enter. Now the first thing it's asking us to do is specify where we want to save the key. And right now it's going to default to this path right here, at least on Linux. If you don't specify a path and file name, then this is the path right here that it's going to create the key in. And this path will be different on macOS. That's okay. We just want to make sure that we don't already have a key at this location. And we can give it a different path and name if we want to create a key and not collide with the original, if there is one. But I don't actually have a key yet, so I'm okay to continue. So I'll just press Enter to accept the default. And next, it's asking us if we want to set a passphrase. Now, a passphrase is highly recommended. It's not required. You'll still benefit from having a public key pair even if you don't use a passphrase. But a passphrase will add an additional layer of security. If you do choose a passphrase, you will need to remember it because there's no way to retrieve it if you forget it. I'm just going to press enter for now for no passphrase. And at this point it wants me to repeat the same passphrase and I didn't enter one, so I'll press enter again. And that's it. We have successfully generated a public key pair for SSH. If we list the storage of the .ssh directory in our home directory, we can now see that there's two files in there, at least. This file right here is the private key. Under no circumstances should you ever show the contents of that file for any reason. And here we have the public key. So as you can see, the public key has an extension of .pub, and the private key has no extension at all. Now I can actually show you the contents of the public key, and it's totally fine to do so. And there it is. This key is going to be different for each and every single one of you. We have the key right here. All this text right here is the key. And then we have the username and the host name of where this key was actually generated. Again, this is the public key. I can show this to you. There's no problem with me doing so. And that's why it's called a public key. You could literally put the contents of this file on a billboard on a busy interstate, and that's fine. But again, under no circumstances, should you ever show the contents of the private key. So what we'll need to do at this point is copy our public key over to our server. But before I do that, I just want to make sure that I'm able to actually connect to that server, and then I'll add the key. So what I'll do is use SSH and then the username. On this particular server, I haven't created a user for myself yet. So for now, I'll just use root. And the IP address, I'll type that in right here. And that's it right there. So at this point, it's confirming if we want to actually connect to that server. It's showing us the fingerprint of that server right here. And that differentiates this server from any other server out there. And I'll just confirm that by saying yes. I'll press enter. Next, I'll type in the password. And now I'm in. So as we can see, SSH is working just fine. But we're not actually using our key just yet. We just verified that we are, in fact, able to connect to the server via SSH. And as you can see, we are. So I'll just hold Control and press D to disconnect. And let's work on the process of actually copying our key from my laptop here over to that server so we could take advantage of public key authentication. And the process of copying a public key over to a server is very simple. 
we have a dedicated command for that purpose. And it's this one right here. So what we're going to do is type ssh-copy-id, and then what we're going to do is type the username yet again, and then the IP address just like last time. So we have ssh-copy-id, and then the username, and then at, and then finally the IP address. So far so good. I'll press enter. And now what we're going to do is type the password for the user on the server side of things. And right here is telling us that the number of keys that it added is one. We only had one key. So that should mean that our public key has been copied over to that server. And to test that, let's try to SSH it to that server one more time and see what's different. There's the command that we used previously to SSH into that server. I'll press enter. And I'm immediately connected to the server. It didn't even ask me for the password. Now, if I had a passphrase on that key, it would have asked me for that. But since I didn't include a passphrase, it just let me write in. I didn't use password authentication. This actually used public key authentication. Now, let's take a look at something interesting here. If I list the contents of the .ssh directory on the server side, you can see that there's a new file there. And it's called authorized underscore keys. That file didn't actually exist until I ran the ssh copy id command to copy my key over to the server. And if I cat the contents of that file, we can see that the contents are actually the same contents of my public key. And that's what the authorized keys file actually is. Now, it may not look like it, but the file right now only has one line. And that one line contains a lot of text, so it's wrapped. It looks like a bunch of lines, but it's only one line. Every time you run the ssh copy id command, it's going to add your public key to a new line in that file. So basically, you have one line here for every key that is being used to connect to the server for that user. All right, so here on Windows, let's see how we could do the exact same thing. I still have PuTTY open on my screen right here, as you can see. And what I'm going to do is, just like last time, test that SSH works first. And then after I test that, I'm going to generate a key and then copy that key over to the server. Now, to make the process simpler going forward, what I'm going to do is create a session in PuTTY. So that way I don't have to manually type out everything every time I want to connect. So what I'll do right here is I'll type the username. And the username was root. And then I'll type the IP address. And then here I'm going to give it a name. And this is a Linode server, so what I'm going to do is call it Linode server. I'll save the connection. And now what I could do so I could close that, go back into PuTTY. I could click on the session that I saved, click load, and it pops that information right here back into that field. That just makes it easier. So I'll click open, I'll accept the connection, and then I'll type in the password. So as you can see, I do have access to that Linode server via PuTTY. So far, so good. So what I'll do is disconnect. And now let's look at the process of creating a key that we can use to simplify the connection. So what I'll do is click on the Start button. I'll go back to PuTTY, or at least the folder for PuTTY. And what I'm going to do is open PuTTY Gen. This is something that's installed by default when you install PuTTY itself. It comes along for the ride, so I'll click on that. And here, this is what we're going to use to generate our key. So it's going to be similar to what we were doing earlier with Linux or Mac OS, but we're doing it here in Windows. So just like last time, I'm going to change the bit size to 4096, just like that, and I'll click Generate. So at this point, what it wants me to do is move my mouse cursor around in the empty part of the window to generate some additional entropy. So just move your mouse cursor around, doesn't matter how you move it around, just keep it inside the window, move it randomly, and it should be good. So at this point, it actually generated the key. So what I'm going to do is right click in this area. I'm going to click Select All, and then I'll right click again and click Copy. And then what I'll do is open up Notepad. I'll paste it in right here. And then what I'll do is just go ahead and save the file. And again, this is the public key, so it's okay that you were able to see the contents of that file. So 
So I'll just create a folder for it. And what I'll do is name it public key. And I'll just save it as all files. I don't actually need to give it a file extension. That should be fine. So now that we have the public key saved, I'll just minimize that for now. We should actually save the private key as well. So I'll click on this button. And like it says here, a passphrase is a very good idea. I'll leave that up to you. But I'll just click yes right here. And right in here, what I'll do is just call it private key. I'll save it. And now we have a public and private key here on Windows that we can use to simplify our connection. So now what we'll need to do is copy that key over to the server so that way we'll be able to use it. So what I'll do is close this and I'll reopen PuTTY. I'll load the session that I saved earlier. We're just connecting manually for now. So I'll click open. I'll type in the password and press enter. As you saw earlier, inside the .ssh directory, we have this file right here, authorized keys. So what I'm going to do is open that file up in an editor. So I'll just use nano. That should be good enough. And as you can see, we have the public key from the first client that connected to the server. So on a different line, what I'll do is paste the contents of the public key, which I copied right here. So what I did was I just held shift and I pressed insert to paste the key right here. And right here, I have the key for Windows pasted on the second line. So I'll hold control and press O to save the file, enter to confirm, and then control X to exit out. So we shouldn't need this anymore. What I'm going to do is close PuTTY and then I'll reopen it. So here in PuTTY, what I'm going to do is load the session. After I do that, under connection, then SSH and then off, what we're going to do is tell PuTTY where to find the private key. And here it is. It's in the SSH keys folder. I'll just click on it and I'll click open. And then back in session, I'll click on the session name that I saved earlier. I'm going to save over top of it because I did tell it where to find the private key and I don't want to have to tell it that every single time. So we should be good. I'll click open. And we're in just like that. So now you know how to use an SSH key pair here in Windows as well. So there you go. Now you guys know the process of setting up public key authentication for SSH, which is absolutely something that you guys should already be doing. Be sure to check the channel for other videos about SSH to learn even more, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.